And last week, we kicked off a brand new series on Romans, specifically the eighth chapter of Romans, where we're looking at what God has to show us about himself and about us. And we've also created a devotional for this series. If, if you'd like to check it out, you can do it at seacoast.org slash Romans. We encourage you to do that because I think it'll help you get the most out of this series. And for the purpose of context for today's message, let me offer you this. You may know it, but let me offer you this. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome, which he was never able to visit. Uh, we know that he was in Rome a couple of times, but both times as a prisoner for having declared Jesus as the son of God. And, and we know that Rome was regarded as one of the most sophisticated cities in the world, which caused people to just flock to it. They wanted to be in Rome. This also meant that Rome would become one of the largest and most ethnically diverse cities in the world. There were roughly one million people within about 10 square miles. Felt a lot like Mount Pleasant these days, right? <laughs> you know. But while Rome was very sophisticated, it was also very corrupt. The citizens of Rome were tired of the ruling classes taking advantage of them. And one thing led to another, which led to another. And suddenly Rome found itself in a civil war in 69 AD, just a couple of years, a few years after Paul wrote this letter. And this, had, in fact, became so common that Rome had 130 civil wars before the city finally fell in 476 AD. And, and while the, the reasons for those wars varied, they had a common thread. And that was this. The people of Rome were very frustrated with the leaders of Rome. And now here we are, <laughs> 2,000 years later. And many of you feel exactly the same way, don't you? And Paul was aware of, no, that's not a moment for applause. That's not a moment for applause. <laughs> Paul was aware of all of this. He knew it. And so he wrote this letter to the Romans to intro, to, as, as a means of making an introduction. He wanted to introduce them to a new kind of leader. The kind of leader who didn't put himself first. The kind of leader who cared more about the people than he did his own self-interests. The kind of leader who didn't have to demand worship because he was truly worthy of worship. That's what Paul set out to do. And the leaders of Rome would later kill Paul for saying any of it. So now that you've got a little more context, let's jump into the text that we're going to look at today, which are those first four verses in chapter 8. And before I do, let me offer you the words of John Piper. He said this, the greatest book ever written was the Bible. The greatest letter ever written was Romans. And the greatest chapter ever written was Romans 8. And here's how Paul starts Romans 8. He says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did, say did, did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, you heard Jack say last week that whenever we see the word therefore in scripture, we've got to back up and figure out what it's there for. And Paul spends seven chapters telling us what it's there for. In those chapters, he maps out three things that we need to understand. We need to understand the problem with us. We need to understand the problem with God. And we need to understand the problem that remains. And that's our outline for today. If you want to follow along, you can do that on the Seacoast app where you can see all the points and references. But let's, let's talk about that first one, the problem with us. Now, Paul wastes no time jumping right into the problem with us in Romans. In chapter 3, he writes, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in chapter 6, he writes, for the wages of sin is death. And we read those two verses and we think, was Paul okay? Like, he seems a little discouraged, a little down. Does he need a hug? Like, that's just a heavy message to kick off with. But it's interesting that God would use someone like Paul to write words like this. Because remember who Paul was. Paul was a leader in the Jewish faith. He was one of the most prominent figures in all of Judaism. 
Not many people knew the law better than Paul. And even fewer followed the law better than Paul. And yet here he is making an admission that all, himself included, have fallen short of what the law requires. And the price for that is separation from the God who made us and loves us. And and the word that Paul uses here to describe this is not one that we like very much. It's the word sin. And in context, the word sin was commonly used as an archery term at the time. And it meant to miss the mark or to miss the target. And, you know, not many of you know this, but my first job in high school was working at a golf course, picking up the driving range. You know, we would drive the little cart around with the cage on it and pick up all the golf balls. And it was me and a few high school guys who did this. And and inevitably, whenever one of us would get in that cart to pick up the balls, the rest of us would start launching golf balls at the cart, right? I mean, this is what high school boys do, right? Fellas, am I right? This is what high school boys do. If you've been one, then you know. If you have one, you also know. But we would start launching golf balls at the cart. And even though there was a cage on it, if you could hit that cart, it sounded like you were inside a hand grenade. And that guy would start cussing and screaming. And we would start laughing so hard we were crying. And so in in the spirit of hitting the mark, hitting the target, I thought that we'd have a little target practice today. So... We've set up a target in the back of the worship center. You can see it up there. And my question is how many of you feel good about the seat you've chosen? How many of you wished maybe I attended a campus today? Huh? Anybody feeling that way? Well, let's see how we do. We want to hit the mark like Paul was talking about. So let me get a golf club here. Now, somebody asked me, they said, hey, if you're going to do this, why don't you use like a pitching wedge or something? And I said, no, man, we're going to go full send on this one. (laughs) This is probably a one shot deal. So there's my target. And let's see how we do. All right. Okay. Everybody just settle down. Here we go. I'm really nervous. Is anybody else (laughs) feeling nervous? Like my hands are sweaty a bit. Are y'all good? Okay, here we go. Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's see how we do. Do you know that the average speed of a golf ball is like 140 miles an hour? I'm just, you know, fair warning is all I'm saying, okay? All right, let's try this. Let's see how we do. All right, I see the target up there. Have you ever gone bowling? You know, when you put up those rails in the lane? And, and they, they, they're meant to keep your ball from going places that it shouldn't go. Those don't exist in golf. This could go anywhere. Ask anyone who's played golf, okay? Just fair. All I'm saying is maybe hands up, okay? All right. Let's see how we do here. All right. I got the target back there. It was online, but it's way short. You didn't think I was going to hit it, did you? You didn't think I would hit it. But I switched the golf ball for a squishy one so I wouldn't kill anybody. We're all okay. For those of you online and at the campuses wondering, we're all okay. But I do have a question. How many of you just peed yourself a little bit? It's okay. It's okay, because I did too. It's all right. (laughs) So what does it mean that we've missed the mark, that we've missed our target? It, It means that when God created life, he also created the way to live it to the fullest. And that was through a relationship with himself. It, it, It was, it meant that we were We were to live in a relationship where we recognized his authority in our lives as the life creator and life sustainer. That was the mark. That was the target. And we, all of us, all of us, we fall short when we decide to do life our way. 
When we disregard or even deny his authority in our lives and think to ourselves, this is my life. I should be able to do it however I want. I should be able to do whatever makes me happy. The problem is that doing whatever we want does not make us happy. It makes us hollow. In the 1800s, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, he knew this. He noticed that the culture was moving away from God. And he said, he wrote this, he said that when a culture loses sight of God, that culture will become weightless. What he meant by that was that the culture will no longer have anything to keep them grounded. That it'll begin to be tossed around by every passing trend. How many of you would agree that sounds kind of familiar right now, doesn't it? And thousands of years before that, the Psalms told us this. Psalm 1, we read, blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Now, that word ungodly, it more literally translates from Hebrew as, uh, or excuse me, did I say that? Wicked, wicked, more literally translates from Hebrew as ungodly or those without God. And you may have heard that uh, that language before in other places in the scripture about wheat and chaff. And it was it was common language because the writers of so many books of the Old and New Testaments knew that their audiences would understand it. But here's why it's important, because wheat is a, is a very small grain that's surrounded by a thin outer shell called the chaff. And to harvest wheat, farmers would toss these kernels of wheat up into the air, and the heavier wheat kernel, it would fall to the ground, while the chaff would break away and just be carried off by the wind. So when you read language like this, where people are described as chaff, it means they are without a center. It means they're weightless. It means they're hollow making them vulnerable to being picked up by every passing trend, which sadly is a pretty good picture of where we are today, isn't it? Let me give you an example. In the early 1900s, Sigmund Freud developed what he called the psychoanalytic theory. And people, most people immediately just embraced his work as freeing and revolutionary. They were swept up by it, feeling like it gave them permission to more freely express their sexual urges in the name of mental health. And anyone who didn't embrace Freud's work at the time, they were considered foolish and ignorant. They were thought to be traditionalists who refused to accept the discoveries of modern science. But do you know that today... Freud's work is largely mocked by modern psychology. We now see that there are huge problems with his theories. Freud insisted that any spiritual longing in the human heart was simply repressed sexual frustration. How many of you know long before Freud came the word of God, which told us That our sexual frustration is most often repressed spiritual longing. 60 years ago, Freud's theories were the trend that almost everyone was buying into. People loved the idea of no longer having to deny their urges, but just embracing and expressing those urges. It sounded great. But now we recognize there are real problems with this because living life without any restraint has real consequences for us and for those around us. How many of you know that's true? Listen, any system that is built around constantly satisfying our urges will eventually enslave us to those urges. What we thought would make us happy has in the end made us hollow because we become like the chaff. We're without a center. We're weightless. We're hollow. And so the problem with us is this. Doing it our way has never really worked out all that well because it eventually leaves us weightless. This is how we fall short and miss the mark. This is what has broken our relationship with God. William Barclay said it this way. He said, the tragedy of life and of this world is not that men do not know God, It's that in knowing him, they still choose to go their own way. Tozer said it this way. Do you know what's wrong with us? 
We are self-pleasers. We live for ourselves. And finally, Augustine said it like this. He said, the definition of sin is really disordered love. It's love in the wrong order. It's loving created things over the creator himself. Loving temporary things over the eternal. And as people who insist on doing it our way and living for ourselves, we've made a mess of our lives and a mess of this world. And not many of us are trying to argue that anymore. We know that the world is a broken place. And we, if we're honest with who we are, we know that we are also broken. And in our broken state, human beings have a unique talent. It's a talent for convincing ourselves that empty things aren't empty, that bad things aren't bad, and that deadly things won't destroy us. This is the problem with us. But God has a problem too. And that brings us to our next point. So what is this problem with God? And, and I know that as I say those words, some of you are twitching because you're thinking, I know God is perfect, so how could there possibly be any problem with God? But just hang with me for a second. I think you'll see that we're on the same page. Because the problem with God is this. He loves us too much to leave us in our brokenness and separation. That's the problem with God. If you look at those same verses that we read a few minutes ago, here's how Paul finishes them. In chapter 3, he said, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the very next verse says, And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In chapter 6, he wrote, For the wages of sin is death. And the very next part of that is, But the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. How many of you th are thankful for the rest of those verses? Yeah. The problem with God is his love for you and me. The problem with God is that he wouldn't let us have what we deserved. And you might be thinking, Adam, this all sounds way better than your first point. You should have led with this. But John Stott reminds us that before we can begin to see the cross as, dump, as something done for us, we have to see the cross as something done by us. You may remember several years ago when people started wearing these bracelets. Do you remember this? Remember what it stood for? Say it with me. What, what would Jesus do, right? Yeah, they were everywhere. People had them stacked up to their elbows. They were all over the place. And it, you know, it's, they were meant to help us ask the question in different situations. What would Jesus do so that our responses and behavior might look more like him? Not a bad question to ask, but I don't think it's the best question. The better question for us to start with is not what would Jesus do, but what has Jesus done? Because when we reflect on what Jesus has done, it could change everything about our lives. The reality that the second person of the Trinity would humble himself and enter the world he made. That he would live a perfect life as an unknown Jewish carpenter. That he would subject himself to being misunderstood and misrepresented. That he would surrender his authority to people who abused their authority. That he would allow himself to be tortured and mocked and eventually crucified. That he would descend into death when he himself was the way, the life, and the truth. That he would rise again to show that hell and death cannot hold him. That is what Jesus has done. And he did it because there's a problem with God. The problem is that he's perfect. He's perfectly just, which meant that a payment had to be made for sin. And yet he is perfectly merciful, which meant that he himself would pay it. So the real problem with God is that there are no problems with God. He's perfect. So there's... The problem with us, there's the problem with God, and then there's the problem that remains. And you might think to yourself, what problem could possibly remain after Jesus' sacrifice? And that's a, that's a fair question. But the problem that remains is our response. How will we respond to the God who would do this for us? Well, let's take a look at what Jesus said about our response. 
In Matthew 13, he was talking with a large group of people, and he told this story. He said, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell along rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, and thirty times what was sown. The whole passage is about our response to God. You see, four different kinds of people, four very different kinds of responses. And while the responses are all different, I want you to notice that the seed is not. The seed is not different. The seed is the only constant in the story. It was all good seed. And that's important for us to remember because the work of God, his justice and his mercy through the person of Jesus was all good. It wasn't good for some and not good for others. It was all good. But the responses were not all good. And the same is true for us. For example, some of us will reject this. We will reject the whole idea of who God is and who Jesus is and what was done for us on the cross. We will reject the idea that we have missed the mark and fallen short of what God desires for us. We will reject this because we refuse to believe that anything has authority over us. We want to have authority over ourselves. We want to decide what is right and wrong, and we insist on living for whatever makes us happy, only to later discover it has made us hollow. Some of us would never reject God, but we may be too busy to care. We get caught up in the pace of life, caught up from what we want in this life. God is somewhere on the list of things that are important to us, but he's got a lot of competition on that list. Some of us will get very excited about God. We may even tell others about our excitement. But when life hits us, when trouble enters our lives, we become frustrated, believing that God has failed us. For us, God was on the list of things that were important to us. But when he didn't come through in the way that we feel like he should have, we went in search of other things to put on the list. These first three groups of people, they they represent those of us who struggle to believe that God could ever be enough for us. Those of us who struggle to believe that the deepest desires of our hearts can only be met by the heart maker. So we look for other things to fulfill us. In 1953, C.S. Lewis published a story called The Silver Chair. And it was about a little girl named Jill who found herself searching for water in a mountain wilderness. And on her journey, she searched and searched and searched, but could find no water anywhere. Suddenly, out of nowhere, she came around a mountain to find the cleanest, purest stream she'd ever seen. It came upon her so suddenly it was almost as if the stream found her and not the other way around. The problem was that next to this stream stood a lion. And if you know anything about C.S. Lewis's books, then you know the lion always represented God. And as she carefully approached, she heard his voice. Are you not thirsty? said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. Would you mind going away while I do, asked Jill. The lion answered with only a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized she might as well have asked the whole mountain to step aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything if I come closer, asked Jill. I make no such promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without even noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, said Jill? I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, 
kings and emperors, cities and realms. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were angry, nor as if it were sorry. It just said it. Then I dare not come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step closer. And I must go and look for another stream. There is no other stream, said the lion. I love the story because it reminds us that Jesus is not one of many ways to approach God. Nor is he even the best of several ways. He is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And to believe otherwise is to believe in someone who is not the risen Jesus. Those of you who know this, you represent the last group that Jesus mentioned. You know that his sacrifice on the cross was for you. And at the same time, it was because of you. And as you have gotten to know him personally, you've noticed that things have begun to change in your life. Things you never thought possible. Your life has become a journey of increasing surrender and therefore freedom and therefore joy. You are who Paul was talking about in verse one. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're experiencing the life that comes without condemnation. But I want you to notice why that's true. Paul tells us this is for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's a very important part of the verse because it's the whole reason condemnation is no longer upon us. The whole passage hangs on two words, in Christ. We see that phrase more than 160 times in Paul's letters. And perhaps the best definition of it is offered to us in 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This means that just as Jesus died, our old way of life died. And just as he was raised again from the dead, we are free to live a new life. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means that we're being perfected. To be in Christ means we're restored to the identity that was given to us by our maker. It means your life is beginning to look more and more like the Savior who died for you. To be in Christ means becoming who and what you were always meant to be. A new creation. A child of the Most High King. It means we are blood bought and mercy covered. It means we're restored and renewed and reborn. It means we are no longer condemned. In the early 1900s, there was a famous escape artist named Harry Houdini. You may have heard of him. Crowds would gather around from all over to watch him escape from ropes and shackles and boxes, all kinds of things. And one reason he was so famous is because he was a great promoter. Whenever he would come to a town, he would go to the prison, to the, to the police station of that town and ask them to lock him in their jail cell. And then people would gather around while he let himself out of the jail, while he freed himself. And they'd be amazed, and then they'd pay to go see his show. Well, during a tour of Scotland, Houdini contacted the local police in a town and asked them to do this very thing, to lock him in their jail. And they agreed. They chained him up, and then chained him to a bench, and then locked him in the jail cell. And people gathered around to watch. Immediately, Houdini freed himself of the chains and then the bench, and then he went to work on the prison door. For more than an hour, he tinkered with the door, trying to set himself free. Eventually, he was drenched in sweat and exhausted. And the story goes that at that moment, he leaned against the prison door and it was open. It had been open all along. The guards tricked him. In all of his effort to free himself, he had been locking the prison door instead of unlocking it. Friends, we may not believe it, and we certainly don't deserve it, but the prison door is open. 
It has been open all along. Jesus opened it at the cross and it remains open today. And we are free to walk out into a new relationship with him where there is no longer any condemnation. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that in all of your perfection, you were able to die in our place and remove our sin, that we might experience the freedom of being in relationship with you where there is no condemnation. Give us the courage, Father, to consider what our response to that might be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.